Good news for Airbnb in France. The country's new budget does not include a tax increase on short-term rentals. Now, that's likely a welcome development for the company after recent weeks have put a spotlight on regulating the platform. And that's all because of New York. The new short-term rental legislation law, which entered effect September 5th, requires that hosts obtain a license every two years. Short-term rentals are only allowed if the host is present for the duration of the guest stay. The city says the policy will help with the housing shortage. Critics say it's a gift to the hotel lobby. Now, while some of Airbnb's, Airbnb's offerings in New York are going away, others are shifting to long-term rentals, those over 30 days, which face fewer restrictions. Take a look at this. In June, roughly half of all Airbnb listings in the city were long-term. Now it's almost 90%. That's according to tech outlet Skift, citing data from AirDNA. Now, last week, I had a chance to sit down with Airbnb co-founder and chief strategy officer Nathan Blacharsik about New York and what went wrong. New York was actually one of the first cities that uh, entered into conversations with us about regulation over a decade ago. Uh, New York has very unique politics, which prevented uh, any meaningful progress uh, in the early days and basically prevented us from finding the sweet spot of compromise and sensible and balanced regulation. Um, and so I really view New York as a, an extreme outlier. And while this has been playing out over 10 years, you know. 80% of those other 200 top markets uh, have found a sensible meeting, uh, middle ground. Um, and so, again, I think, it's, I think it's an outlier. So you would say this doesn't give other cities a blueprint for what to do with Airbnb in terms of regulation? No, I don't think so. I think, frankly, it's a, a blueprint of what not to do. Um, because, you know, clearly there's a lot of ordinary New Yorkers that were hurt uh, by this very extreme draconian position that the city took. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's even many officials would say that this is the way it should be, but it's a byproduct of politics. It's a byproduct of the previous administration that passed the rules, and now the current administration in New York has to implement them. I don't think they're particularly happy with those rules, but that was kind of the hand they were dealt. Um, and you know, I think other cities have already regulated, mm -hmm. and. Uh, are a much better model that strikes the balance of um, you know, addressing uh, oftentimes housing affordability questions, but also recognizing that about half of hosts, if you ask them, will tell you that they use Airbnb to afford their everyday living expenses. Mm -hmm. right? So you, know, you care about affordability, but you can't, you shouldn't at least, take away the means by which so many people create affordability for themselves. Can you tell us what you're seeing in New York right now in terms of listings falling away, things like that? Can you give us any sense of how serious this is right now as we see it? Well, I haven't followed it closely on a day-by-day -day basis, but effectively the regulation doesn't allow for home sharing unless it's an extra bedroom in your home. Mm -hmm. But if it's your entire place, um, for the most part, that's no longer permitted. So you know, uh, we've now started enforcing that, uh, actually uh, canceling reservations uh, and removing the properties off the website. When you look at Europe, obviously regulation has also been a big theme here. Is there anything that sticks out? You've had some success in some areas, like with Berlin, there was a back and forth as well, but now it seems to have really come to your favor a little bit. Um, do you see the, the, the environment here sort of going more towards Airbnb in terms of working with you on regulations, or do you see it still as being a little bit, um, I guess, antagonistic in some ways? Just generally speaking. Yeah, well, over the last decade, we've spent a lot of time uh, with European cities uh, kind of hashing out these issues. And for the most part, they're all regulated at this point, the top markets at least. Um, and so, you know, we've kind of, you know, figured out what that middle ground is uh, and moved beyond the debate um, to, uh, you know, now basically um, just operationalizing uh, these, these regulations. So. You know, I would say that there certainly was, uh, you know, more uh, noise uh, several years ago. I think we moved beyond that um, because we we were willing to compromise. Um, I don't think the issues just solved themselves. It was definitely, um, you know, both parties leaning in, and um, you know, ultimately working towards sensible regulation. Some of these fundamental issues that cities are always pointing to, like affordable housing, um, too much tourism, obviously not caused necessarily by Airbnb, um, but they will turn to you. It's very clearly, um, we see this time and time again, they'll turn to Airbnb as a solution. Um, 
is that, uh, is that frustrating to see that happen? And what does that mean for the reliability of these large urban centers that in many ways you staked your business on? The New Yorks, the Londons, the Parises, the Amsterdams, these are all places where they're now saying, we've got problems with too many tourists or with expensive uh, and not enough uh, apartments. Is it just sort of this constant fight with these urban areas? Well, uh, let's take over tourism as an example. You know, it is a real issue in some European cities. Uh, if you take Venice, for example, you read about this quite often, I think. Uh, if you look at the numbers, Airbnb only hosts 3% of the bidders, visitors that go to Venice. Um, so, you know, it's really much more of a general tourism pro problem than it is an Airbnb problem. That being said, you ask, is it, you know, frustrating that, you know, oftentimes uh, we're expected to solve these problems. I think, look, it goes hand in hand with being a more mainstream and recognized company. And, you know, the good news is they know our name uh, and they expect us to, to be a part of the solution. And, and I think that's how I try to look at it. You know, how can we go um, and use our creativity to bring a solution to the table, even though it's not a uniquely Airbnb problem, you know, maybe we can inspire um, others on creative ways to, to uh, do the right thing. I'll give you an example of over tourism. We actually have invested effort into how might we disperse tourism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, oftentimes people going to a new city, they have a certain destination downtown in mind. That's all they know or all they've heard of. But when they're searching on Airbnb, we now uh, showcase properties in different neighborhoods mm -hmm. and paint a better picture of what it's like to not stay in the downtown, but maybe somewhere more residential or off the beaten path. Uh, maybe not even go to the city, go to a rural area. Through the product functionality that we've built, we've actually been very effective moving people to stay in different places than they otherwise would. And we've been able to measure that difference. Um, and so I think that's a pretty creative solution to the challenge. It doesn't solve the problem. The problem is much bigger than Airbnb. But I hope you know, others in the industry kind of look at uh, what we have done and some of, the, some of the creativity around it and try to find similar creative solutions in their, their spaces. At the same time, we know that those big city centers are going to be probably a bulk of your revenue, uh, and that's also where the hotels are, of course, and they've been trying to compete more and more with Airbnb by offering certain incentives, uh, apartment hotels, things like that. Where do you see that challenge these days? Is that, is that something where they've caught up in some ways or they're, they're making um, uh, progress that, that you have to stay in front of? I mean, I know that Airbnb always talks about reliability being a key thing to match what the hotels can offer in terms of the reliable stay. Um, do you see that the hotel industry is keeping up and putting pressure on you? Yeah, I really don't see the success of hotels coming at the expense of Airbnb or vice versa. Um, you know, we offer different products at the end of the day. And, you know, both are a form of accommodation, but the value proposition is very different. And I think the best thing we can do as an industry is give consumers a lot of different choices so that they can decide for their use case, you know, what what's, makes the most sense. You know, right now I'm traveling with my family. Uh, I need three bedrooms. I want them to have, a, I value having a kitchen too. You know, a home uniquely serves that use case. If I was doing business travel for one night, you know, I think a hotel might be better for that use case. So, um, you know, I think cities should want to support many different use cases and you need a range of products to do that, hotels, homes. Um, and as Airbnb, you know, we aren't overly concerned on, you know, any one market for our revenue. It's very, very diversified business. We're in 100,000 different cities and towns all over. Um, and so, uh, you know, just because there's regulation in one city um, or hotels are very strong in some downtown area doesn't mean there isn't plenty of other, you know, opportunity and use cases for us to serve elsewhere. Your CEO has talked about Airbnb being in growth mode. Um, what does that mean? Where is the next big growth for you guys? Yeah, I think growth mode, you know, first and foremost means constantly innovating, right? Uh, constantly thinking about, you know, what are the product things we could do to unlock new use cases? I talked just a moment ago about uh, dispersing tourism. Um, and, you know, that effectively uh, opens up our capacity to host more people uh, by making uh, more destinations relevant uh, to a big audience. Um, you know, some of the growth we're seeing right now specifically uh, here in Europe is coming out of Germany, actually. We saw 63% growth in number of guests in H1 of this year uh, versus 2019 before the pandemic. So that's quite strong growth. What do you attribute that to, by the way? I mean, why did you see such strong growth here? This has been a regulatory challenge, often known for difficult regulations, this country. Germany is known to be um, 
you know, a tougher market to break into from a consumer perspective, and then there's a the regulation too. Um, but we have done a lot of work to localize the product. For example, we know that Germans uh, often plan their vacations far in advance. You know, January, February comes, and they're booking summer already. Uh, one of the things we did was a product called Pay Less Upfront. So now when you book on Airbnb, you only put 20% down, and you can pay the other 80% later, closer to when the trip happens. We saw that be a big needle mover uh, in Germany. Uh, and we've done other things uh, to promote um, some of the great destinations uh, within Germany. There's a, uh, the Weinstein Palace, uh, which is featured on the Netflix program, The Empress. We featured that in some of our marketing and created a contest around that. So we've tied into the local market in some interesting ways. Uh, and I think we're seeing the results, uh, disproportionate growth in Germany relative to Europe. I have to ask you about another market, and that is China. You were head of Airbnb China, and then it closed its domestic operations last year. Now, you still, of course, promote outbound travel with Airbnb. Can you shed any light on what happened there? Yeah. Well, the domestic market in China is very competitive, um, as is the China tech scene in general. Uh, so there were a number of other companies operating in there, um, as well as the pandemic uh, you know, made uh, the growth prospects uh, pretty limited. And we made the decision to really focus. I mean, I think that's what, something we learned during the pandemic is we, we were going in a lot too many different directions, frankly. And so for us, what we think is the real opportunity in China is Chinese outbound travelers. They are the biggest spenders of, on tourism um, prior to the pandemic uh, worldwide, even more than Germans, because Germans are number two. <laughs> uh, but, and that is where we have a distinct advantage uh, because we have a global network. So we decided to focus on the app component of the business that is both the largest and where we have the advantage and let go of, of the domestic uh, operation. There are also concerns about giving too much data potentially to certain agencies in Beijing, if I understand this right. Did that serve any sort of role in this decision at all? Some of the decisions about or some of the, the necessity to share information with Beijing or with regulators there? Well, I think irrespective of that, you know, the business dynamic that I described in terms of the competition and the pandemic, uh, you know, supported this decision. Um, of course, we have very high standards when it comes to data security uh, and, and such, um, and we, that's true all over the world. Um, so, you know, those are standards we we always uphold. Uh, the Chinese economy is obviously sort of in, in a bad spot right now, but it is, of course, one of the biggest markets in the world. Could you imagine Airbnb going back? Well, For to be the clear, domestic listings, that is. Yeah, yeah. We, we right. We're still in China just focus on consumers going abroad. The domestic listings, um, I don't think the dynamic I described is gonna change, right? There's still intense domestic competition, and now that we left, it'll be that much harder to re-enter, right? So I, 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 I don't think you should expect that. Yeah, we talked about the pandemic, the post-pandemic. Um, we always talk about these travel phases. Uh, where are we from Airbnb's perspective when you look at what's happening now? Is this post-pandemic? Are we post-post-pandemic? How, how should we look at it? We've seen uh, a lot of the travel trends from before the pandemic resume, like international travel, cross-border travel. Um, but we also see a continuation of some of the things that changed during the pandemic. Uh, we continue to see a lot of interest in rural destinations, longer term stays, um, and there's, there's less business travel, uh, frankly. Um, but you know, those international trips, they've come back, and um, definitely Airbnb is a bigger company post-pandemic than it was before. In Germany, uh, we've seen in the first half of 2023, 63% uh, more, more nights booked by guests uh, than the same period uh, before the pandemic in 2019. Does it, does it surprise you that you're here con considering those first days of the pandemic? You talk about this in a number of interviews. I always find it interesting. Um, you IPO'd in the middle of the pandemic, which at the beginning had wiped away, what, 80% of your bookings? What does that mean to sort of see where you are now versus those first days? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to describe how terrifying uh, that period was. And I know it was for many people. Uh, this is not uniquely an Airbnb problem. It was a travel problem. It was a whole societal issue. People were experiencing the pandemic in, in very acute and different ways. Um, but for us, you know, at the start of 2020, we were preparing to go public. We had that in mind. We had written the S1 document, uh, and then the pandem ha pandemic happened, and we lost 80% of our business, 80% of our revenue in the span of just eight weeks. Um, so that was a huge uh, curveball, to say the least. We had to take dramatic action to right-size the company. Um, and then, basically, we got out of this hole by being very agile, we realized that 
even though uh, it was a pandemic um, and people couldn't travel internationally, they didn't want to get on airplanes, but they still wanted to get out of their homes. They just, uh, they wanted to go somewhere nearby. They wanted to go somewhere rural. Um, they wanted to find a home for a month where they could make a pod with their, their, their other family members. And so we leaned into those needs. Um, and in the span of, you know, just a month or two, we were able to launch new product functionality to support these use cases. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly this change in consumer behavior uh, became a tailwind to the company. And by the end of 2020, we were able to resume our IPO plans and launch a successful IPO uh, that December of 2020. You mentioned some of the, the pandemic trends or some of the, the features that have sort of stayed as part of uh, this pandemic time or after this pandemic time. Um, what else do we see? I would imagine remote working plays into what you guys see as well. Although in some ways people are returning to the office a little bit more. How do you see remote working playing out with Airbnb? I mean, is that a long-term um, something that will offer sort of a new solution for you guys or sort of new opportunities? Yeah, I, I absolutely think so. I think even if people are going back to the offices, there's definitely more of an acceptance of, of hybrid work and people having the flexibility uh, to work while they're not actually in the office. And so I think what that allows for are uh, longer trips, long weekends, more spontaneous travel. Um, and so I think you know, for Airbnb, that's promising. Um, and we've also tried to make sure we have the functionality that, so that people know that when they book an Airbnb, they can get a good work environment. We have a feature called verified Wi-Fi where we can certify the bandwidth in the home to make sure that you're comfortable that Zoom is gonna work for your needs or whatever else for that matter. Um, so I think that's a use case that is, is here to stay, even if some people are going back to the office. We've seen another legacy of the pandemic or the period after the pandemic is rising inflation, rising costs. Airbnb has singled out affordability as a big issue. Um, what are you hearing from your, your, your customers essentially here? Um, these, to some extent, you can't really control so much what the hosts are charging. How do you respond to that? Um, affordability is on everyone's mind. Um, and you know, I think for guests, what's special is that we have something at every price point including you know, private rooms where you, you can rent an extra bedroom in someone's home. And you know, besides the unique hospitality you get, um, you know, the average private room on Airbnb is 60 euros a night. 80% of them are less than 90 uh, euros per night. So that's a pretty unique price point. Um, but you know, we also just want to make sure in general that Airbnbs are as, as affordable as possible. So we're working with our hosts and giving them um, tools to understand what a competitive price looks like. One of the things that we notice hosts doing when they're setting their price is, well, they simply search and they see who in their neighborhood is hosting and what, what are they setting their prices mm -hmm. to be. Well, now when they do that, um, we have a tool whereby they can see the difference between what people ask for in terms of the price and what people are actually getting, meaning that the, the listings that get the bookings are often priced lower than the listings that don't get the bookings. Mm -hmm. Those are typically priced higher. So this overall um, has allowed hosts to be more competitive, actually have lower prices. Uh, we're also now doing a lot to show uh, the full price, meaning cleaning inclusive fees. of fees and cleaning fees, and not just for guests, but also for hosts, so that they see the full cost that the guest is paying. And the effect of that is that hosts are setting lower prices. Um, the final thing I'll just say is that um, the affordability issue also is a motivator for hosts to join the platform. Uh, we've seen 19% um, increase in, um, in uh, new listings on the platform uh, most recently. Uh, and you know, that represents an acceleration of, um, of, of people hosting. And I think it's being driven by the fact that people value the extra income right now. Mm. In a climate where prices are going up, people want extra income and they can get that through hosting on Airbnb part-time. There's evidence also that over the years there have become more people who are professional listers or they have multiple homes that they're listing. And one has a sense sometimes that, um, that as you often emphasize how important these properties are for the host as well for income, um, that there is kind of a much more uh, motivated reason, income-based reason that many people are doing this. Does it feel sometimes like some of the whimsy of Airbnb has sort of fallen away as you have more of these multiple listers, professional listers even, um, and then you have these ratcheted, these cleaning prices that have been ratcheted up, for example. You know, it seems like people are very much attached to a certain kind of price. Um, does it feel like you're, you've come a long way from the first days in some ways? 
Um, well, look, we started with air beds, and that was the entire product. So we've come a long ways from that. And today, we really have a lot of different types of hosts and listings. And I really believe that there's something for everyone on the Airbnb platform. And so for the right use case, I think each type of accommodation uh, can make a lot of sense. Um, you know, we strive for transparency and um, you know, making sure that everyone is providing meeting expectations and providing uh, a great consumer experience. We do that through the reviews that we collect after each stay. Um, and so that's the standard that everyone needs to live by, whether they're an individual host or a professional host. Um, but I'll also say that you know, cities have better defined what kind of home sharing uh, you know, they want in their, in, their, in their cities. And if you look at the top 200 markets for Airbnb, 80% of them have regulation in place. And you know, that's something that's been happening over the last 10 years. I mean, Airbnb has been around for 15 years and probably 10 years ago, uh, you started seeing the first regulation and now we've seen that play out. And so most markets are regulated um, and some markets have stricter rules and regulation. Uh, and then others are kind of traditional, maybe vacation destinations, uh, you know, where you have a lot of second homes um, or even more professional properties. Um, so it varies a lot by market. One last question. We're here talking a lot about deep tech, um, this, this, uh, this conference that we're at. Um, uh, AI, a big part of it. You're a software engineer. Um, what do you see when you look at AI and the future of, of programming and development? I'm just sort of curious. Well, the progress made in AI is mind blowing. I think it has implications for all industry, uh, including programming, and like it's going to make developers more productive. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are talking about AI and how it's going to, um, you know, replace human beings or whatnot. Um, you know, I don't know if that's true. I th think of AI as a tool that can enhance human work. But in the case of Airbnb, um, our business is ultimately about uh, connecting humans. So. When we employ AI, we're going to think about how do we not eliminate humans or replace humans, uh, but how do we use AI to create trust and better match uh, our guests with properties, set the expectations right, um, and you know basically process a lot of information, whether it be reviews or information that's hidden in pictures, you know, and basically use the AI to pull all that out and paint a very clear picture to consumers about what it is they're booking um, or you know, who the other guests and hosts are on the platform. Nathan Blachar, so thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me.